Welcome to church and welcome to all you who are looking uh, online with us and joining us for worship this morning. If you don't know me, my name is Hugh O'Brien and it's lovely to be back with you again to um, share with you in worship. One or two in pieces of information from the highlights. Uh, there is, of course, the AGM on Saturday, the 20th, at 7 o'clock. And there's going to be a social element of that as well, so come along and enjoy that as well as deal with the short piece of business which the church has to deal with at this time. Big time of cha change for every congregation, including this one and St. Andrews and others in the surrounding area. So it's good to keep up to date with things. There is a sheet at, in the vestibule regarding the AGM, and if you're intending to come along, just for catering purposes, it would help folk to know that you're coming along. So if you could just add your name to the sheet as you leave, that would be helpful if you haven't done that already. There are other things happening. The United Service, the next one, is on the 28th of April at St. Andrew's Church. And I see from the women's group that on the 17th of April, there's a games and quiz night. Bring along a pen and some paper, and uh, it starts at 7.30 in the small sanctuary. All women, welcome. So, please keep up to date with everything that's happening here in the congregation, and be as much part of it as you can be. Today's service, um, notwithstanding everything that's happened during this week, in fact, over these last 24 hours, uh, the service um, today has got an agricultural theme to it. And so I'm going to read from Psalm 147. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving and compose music to our God with the lyre. He shields the heavens with the clouds, preparing rain for the earth and making grass grow on the hills. He gives wild animals their food, including the young ravens when they cry. He takes no delight in the strength of a horse and gains no pleasure in the runner's swiftness. But the Lord is pleased with those who fear Him, with those who depend on His gracious love. We're going to commence our service by singing from Psalm 95, O come and let us to the Lord.
Let's pray together. God, who made the earth, the heavens proclaim your glory. Day by day and night by night, you are more desired than gold, sweeter than honey. And so, with all creation, we offer you our worship and our praise. God, who came among us, companion on the road, the living temple of our faith, with all your church in this place and every place, in this time and every time, we offer you our worship and our praise. God, who dwells alongside us, even within us, your breath gives life, your wisdom gives faith, your sovereign nature brings strength. And so together we seek your Spirit and give thanks for your indwelling. God who made us, God who is one with us, God who guides us, we confess that we have not nurtured and protected your creation as we ought. We've not loved one another as we should. We've not followed you as you have asked us to closely. And we have not been open as we should have done to your guidance. And so in the silence, we ask and seek your forgiveness today. Thank you, God, for grace and love. In receiving them, may we never take them or you for granted. And here is now as we join our voices as one body, the body of Christ, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Isn't, hasn't it been lovely to see the daffodils? Many of, I've got a few of them here. Um, many of them now past their best, but some still beautiful in full bloom. And tulips and other colors coming through the ground. It's wonderful. And so, I thought we'd sing today that lovely old hymn for the beauty of the earth as we give thanks to God for His goodness to us. Thank you. 
still okay. But um, it's hard to see in our garden anyway in Macduff, ones that hadn't weren't past their best, but there are a few, and these are a few of them. Um, wonderful. Great seeing color coming through the ground, and it reminds us very much of new life that we celebrated just a few weeks ago at Easter, but also of God's provision for us today and these many blessings. I'm going to take this out at the moment, and I'll just put them over here. We take a lot of God's blessings for granted, and of course, here I've got um, a vase, and this is uh, full, I think, of water, is it? Yeah, there is water in it. We'll just check that. That's great. And when you think of it, water itself is a blessing from God because it gives us life, gives us life. But I wonder, how much do we take things for granted? Because you see, God's blessings are more than we can imagine. They are more than we can imagine. For example, we maybe think that He's given us everything that He can give us, and yet God keeps giving and giving more. He gave us the world. He gave us the lovely countryside around us. He gave us the sea that we know so well. And even when we think that He stopped giving, He just continues to give. He gave us His Son, Jesus, that we might have life, and we know that, as I said, from Easter, that we might have life and life to the full. And yet, even then, He didn't stop giving us. Gives and gives and gives. And you think, has He given me everything that He can? But when you think back, even in this last week, even this last month, the gifts that God has given you. Life every morning. Air to breathe. Lovely countryside around us. Colors. And you think, well, that is quite amazing. Our God never, ever stops giving. But I wonder how many times we take Him for granted. How many times have we failed to look at the wonders around us and failed to give Him thanks? But you see, even in that, God doesn't forget us. He just keeps continuing to give us His blessing. I wonder if today you might perhaps anew realize His goodness and realize that God will continue just to give and to give and to give and to give. Are we going to stop giving him thanks or will we just continue to thank him for all his blessings to us? And I think I have to stop there because the bowl won't take any more. And I'll put this over here because we're going to sing a song which has got a... a garden, uh, food, agricultural um, theme to it. It's called, Thank You, Lord, for this fine day. Do we know it? Do you know? Thank you. Oh, wonderful then. The tune and the words are going to be on the screen. So let's stand now. We are ready to sing, Thank You, Lord, for this fine day.
we're going to have um, our readings from God's Word. And just in case there's anyone sitting out there waiting to come up to do the readings, you can come up now. But I don't expect it because I didn't get big, I wasn't given somebody's name. So we will uh, we'll read together. And the readings, I think, um, the list will probably come on the screen. Firstly, we're going to read from the Old Testament. It's three very short readings. First one is Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4. Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. And we'll return to that later. The second reading from the New Testament is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, reading from the seventh verse. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, reading from the seventh verse. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us, because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? And our final reading is from Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, reading from the first verse. Paul writes, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering, like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, Anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Continuing with our agricultural theme we sing, we plough the fields and scatter the good seed on the land. Thank you. 
Well, my friends, we meet here together to worship God, the creator of all that is. And we meet to thank Him, don't we, for His great goodness to us, some of which we've spoken about and sung about already. In particular this day, I'd like us to think about the gift of agriculture and think about the people who labor on the land to rear the livestock that the rest of us might benefit, those who bring in the harvest and a lot of the work before that happens. You see, farming, when you think about it, is found at the very root of the experience of humankind. Indeed, Scripture tells us that it was our first occupation in many ways. Gardeners might think because it was Garden of Eden, it was gardeners who was the first people around. But when you look at um, the man, Adam, the first man, Adam, of course, God put in the Garden of Eden to work it and care for it, look after it, but also to benefit from it. There are many famous farmers lift, listed in the Bible. For example, Abel, right at the beginning, Genesis, kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. Genesis chapter 4, verse 2. Noah. Now, we think about Noah as making an ark. But do you know he was a man of the soil? He went on to plant a vineyard. Genesis chapter 9, verse 20, you'll read that. Isaac planted crops in the land. And the same year, he reaped hundredfold of crops because the Lord blessed him. And you can read that in Genesis chapter 26, verse 12. First Kings chapter 19, verse 19. We read, so Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. And so there we have farming at the very beginning of the Bible, and here we have with Elisha beginnings of teamwork within farming as well, people working together to bring forth goodness from the land. David, of course, great king. But before he was a great king, he was a shepherd, of course. And what a legacy David has left us in the 23rd Psalm. I don't know if we have any shepherds here with us today, but the 23rd Psalm is probably the most quoted text in the whole of the Bible. Those six verses and 118 words have met us in a time of need. They've entered many a sick room, many a prisoner's cell. They've dried many a tear, and they've caused us to shed a few as well. That Psalm of David, the 23rd Psalm, swells the heart. It soothes the pain. It comforts the sorrowful, and it's done so throughout the ages. And for part of that, I was quoting from previous theologians. The imagery used has caught the imagination of all of us, the 23rd Psalm, both rural dwellers and urban dwellers who have never perhaps even walked the hills or passed by a field. I must tell you, just by way of slight aside, a very quick story. And we'll, we'll not make it Aberdeenshire, let's make it Angus. There's an Angus farmer standing out, solitary in his field, and this man was driving past and saw this farmer just standing in his field. And two hours later, the man drove back from where he had been, and there was a farmer standing in the exact same place, right in the middle of his field. And that gripped the imagination of the guy who was driving the car. So he stopped his car, got out, and walked into the field, walked up to the farmer. And he said, excuse me, can I ask you something? He said, aha. Uh -huh. He said, what are you doing? You've been standing in the same position right in the middle of this field. And I've been away for two hours and you're still here. 
and he said, oh, he said, uh, I'm hoping to get a prize. He said, oh, right. What prize are you hoping to get? He says, the Nobel Prize. He said, a Nobel Prize? That's wonderful. How are you going to get that? He says, well, I heard on the radio this morning that Nobel Prizes are given to people who are outstanding in their field. <laughs> Sometimes we can misunderstand the Bible as well, can't we? When you think about it. Our Lord Jesus was a great teacher. When he walked his earth, he used much around him to teach people, and we can read about that in the Gospels, can't we? He was able to communicate effectively, effectively with people by using themes well known as illustrations, well known to the people that were listening to him, wherever he was. And being largely an agrarian or agricultural society, Many of Jesus' illustrations related to the land, or crops, or farmers, or shepherds. And so high was his view of these occupations that he spoke of himself as the good shepherd. And he used a farming scene in one of his most powerful illustrations of the love and forgiveness of God. And that was, of course, the story of the prodigal son. For that story is as much about the father as it is about the errant son. And two of us in that other parable of Jesus can fail to get the message about seed falling on different types of soil in the parable of the sower. By the way, I wonder if you've ever thought about that parable and thought about the circumstances in which Jesus was teaching people. You see, it's good to know a wee bit about the background. Yes, the parable was about hearing and responding to the gospel. But again, Jesus uses an illustration from agriculture. I wonder, actually, if he was looking at a farmer away in the distance when he was speaking to the folk around him. You see, unlike our Western farming practice of plowing and sowing fields, the practice then and even in some places today in the Middle East, was to sow the seed and then till it into the soil. And so when the seed was sown, much of the ground would have been trodden, trodden over and made a path, would have been hard. Hence the seed falling on the hard ground. And so you see, even as identified within the Bible, in the pages of the Bible, Agriculture teaches us a lot, whether or not we're farmers or involved in agriculture, or even if we live in the country. But all of these illustrations teach us. Agriculture is central to our situation. It's crucial for the sustaining of life. And it's an occupation which is held in high esteem by God. In fact, there's really not a comparable partnership when you think of it between God and human beings than when it comes to farming. The life-sustaining, renewable resources of the land given by God, nurtured by humankind in partnership. Close to the stuff of creation, in fact. And along with the hard work that provides those involved with a, a unique it involves those with a unique privilege and a responsibility. But as with others aspect, other aspects of our foreign, fallen world, it also brings with it frustration. Farming does, I'm sure. And if you're a farmer, you'll know that. And even hardships. And as the demands of governments, retailers, consumers grow, and as developments in technology and biochemistry surge ahead, ethics and decision-making processes which farmers have to address every day means that life takes on a greater level of complexity for them. Who would be stewards of the land today? And yet, thankfully, many still choose that way of life. And I suspect that at least one or two of you are here today with us in church. 
And we others who are not farmers must rightly give thanks for the commitment, the planning, the labor, the investment, the lifestyle that is their experience. Now, I've got some very, off the internet, I've got some very quick facts about farming just to show us how important it is even to us here in Scotland. Scotch beef, for example, is world-renowned for its quality. There are around 1.6 million cattle in Scotland. Now, this has been dropping in recent years. Total production of beef is worth more than 675 million pounds to this British economy. And as you'll know, there are fewer Dairy, there are dairy cattle, uh, dairy farmers, but fewer dairy farmers in the northeast. There are approximately 6.5 million sheep in Scotland. Can you believe it? Just under 50% are lambs, and around 38% are ewes. More than 20% of all sheep in the UK are here in Scotland. And we've also got 317,000 pigs, and you pass most of them between here and Elgin, don't you? There are lots of, there are 14 million poultry birds in Scotland, 6 million egg producing, and about 6.5 million are reared for meat production. There are 459,000 hectares of cereals and oil seeds grown in Scotland. And then amongst them are spring barley, wheat, oats, winter barley, oil seed, rape, rye, all of these. But the main cereal, the main cereal grown in Scotland, does anyone know what it is? Barley. 35% of it goes to malting and 55% roughly for animal feed. And of course, over and above that, you've got potatoes, fruit and veg, soft fruit, and other livestock such as llamas, farmed deer, beehives, and the like. Amazing when you think about agriculture in our land. And you know, each arable farmer, I'm sure, looks to his or her crop with cautious optimism from seed time until harvest each year. But they know that as harvest approaches, that at the last minute the weather can change and there's nothing they can do to protect the crop. And surely it's there that faith is needed. And you know that faith and trust are inherent in the first of our short readings. I mentioned we'd come back to it. Ecclesiastes 11.4. Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. Now that doesn't mean we should never not pay attention to the weather forecast. But it means if we allow things, not just in agriculture but in our lives, if we allow things to hit us without trust, without faith. We can be fixed. We can stand still. We can fail to move forward. And if we never step forward because of uncertainties, and if we don't have faith, then we won't really live and grow as we should. We won't mature as God would have us do. Stepping forward, or to mix my metaphors, stepping out of the boat, if you like, in faith, means to acknowledge that we're not in charge, that God's ultimately in charge, and to have trust in Him. And so it's quite apt that we acknowledge that here in Turf, sitting at the heart of farming country and close to the coast, a place where the harvest of the land and the sea comes together for our benefit. And all around us, if you open your eyes and look as you leave church today, all around us we see evidence of farming which has been part of our land since time immemorial. And so today, in conclusion today, we praise God for His wonderful provision. And we also give thanks for farmers and those who work on our behalf. And we also give thanks for researchers and innovators and all others who have contributed to the development of agriculture over the decades. And we also want to commend them to God's keeping, them and their families. And we want to ask for wisdom for them and for governments and others 
who bring about laws and strategies and practices and policies in food production as we pray for proper protection of and the fair distribution of our world's resources. And so we remember then, finally, farmers and farming families in these difficult times. And we ask that we all might be challenged about our own selfishness and what we demand of them and our food and the pressure we put those who produce it under. Look at our priorities. Does our fruit and veg, for example, need to look uniform in size and shape? Do we really need them displayed on our supermarket shelves as if we were walking through an art gallery? Do they need to be completely washed and even polished before we'll think about buying them? All of these processes use vital energy and other resources which come as an expense and cost to us as consumers, but more importantly, our world. Do you know what's happening to know that some supermarkets have introduced wonky vegetables. Have you bought any? Wonky vegetables. Bumps and things sticking out where they shouldn't. But many uh, supermarkets are selling these at a lower cost. You see, when they're chopped, grated and mashed, you'd never know what they looked like in the first place. So as we meet to worship God today, our great provider, We celebrate all that's produced, all that's been developed, and all that's been achieved in our world and within agriculture by our farmers and the farming communities. Earlier on I said, let's not take God's provision for granted. Let's not take our farming families for granted either. Let us pray. Father God, we live in a world, your beautiful world, but a fragile world where creation feels under threat, where the rule of law seems fractured, where arrogant leaders cause havoc and the poor are crushed underfoot in many places. Despite it all, this in faith we believe that goodness is stronger than evil, that love is stronger than hate, that light is stronger than darkness, that life is stronger than death, that victory is ours through Christ who loves us. Loving God, we bring our prayers for others, for justice for the poor, for food for the hungry, for an end to war, for the breaking down of walls and the building up of love. And today, Father, we acknowledge everything that's happening in the Middle East at the moment. And Father, we pray for the Holy Land and its neighbors. We pray for peace in the Middle East, that common sense and love would overcome. Father, it will need a miracle. You are a God of miracles. You are the God of miracles. And Lord, we also pray today for all affected by the shopping mall attack yesterday in Sydney. Our hearts go out to those who have lost loved ones those in hospital, and those who seek to support them in the turmoil of their experience. Merciful God, we bring our prayers for the governments of our land, for the nations of the world, for those who hold positions of leadership globally, nationally, and in local communities. May they govern wisely in the interest of all in the protection of the planet to your eternal glory and for your everlasting purposes. And Lord, we 
today pray for our farmers, farm workers, and their families. We pray for strength and endurance, wisdom and integrity. We pray that they would have a real sense of the special relationship which is theirs in nurturing and caring for the land, for farm creatures, for caring for their families and themselves. Thank you for all who work in and support agriculture and our rural communities. May each of us see your Creator's hand in our countryside, in our food, and in the revolving seasons of the year which you have set in place. May we never take your provision for granted, but in all things and at all times give you the glory. Finally, Father, we pray for one another, for friends and family, for those for whom we have specific concerns. And in the silence, we bring our private prayers before you now. Father, hear these and all our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, that good shepherd, our Lord and Master. Amen. May the pleasure being leading worship today with you. Please um, remain. I'm sure there's a cup of tea. I'm looking for a couple of nodding heads. A couple of tea probably awaiting you at the end of the service. So please um, stay behind if you can and have a chat. And you can maybe then try and work out how the vase worked earlier <laughs> in the service. We're going to close our service. And you're getting out early today, by the way. I must do better. We'll close our service as we sing, Now Thank We All Our God. God's blessings and to ask perhaps how we might ourselves be part of the answer to our prayers for others. And the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit go with you this day and forevermore.